Hey everybody, welcome back to Monroe Live. We're here at IIHS and we have Sean O'Malley, who's a senior test coordinator. And we have Paul Lester, who's our body structures expert extraordinaire. And we have the luxury of getting a tour of this great facility. And we're also gonna see a crash test today. And one of the most popular things that IIHS had, had done is they ran in, uh, they, they had a Chevy Malibu and what is this, Sean? It's a 1959 Chevrolet Bel Air. But this just shows you how much crash safety has improved over the years because when you're using basic mild steel versus the amazing safety measures that modern cars have, that video shows the, the amount of safety that you have with modern vehicles versus the old stuff. And is there anything you wanna add, Sean? No, I mean, um, we ran this vehicle and then that vehicle, the same overlap at the identical speed, 40 miles per hour. Um, mild ankle injury for the driver dummy in the Malibu, uh, potential decapitation of the head, the legs, we had to take the dummy's legs apart to get them out of the vehicle. Um, so yeah, fatal possible limp, the difference. Yeah. And you can see the paint all on the steering wheel and the dash. I think they put paint all over the head yes, and we, torso. Yep, yep. So let's see where it impacted. Yeah, there's there's no room for the occupant anymore in this vehicle. Yeah, and when you're watching our Monroe Live vehicles, when we're tearing down Teslas and the Mach-E and the F-150 Lightning, we, when we talk about all these high-strength steel materials and, and different crash mitigations for oblique pole, roof cr crush, ejection mitigation, many of these safety standards are pioneered by this organization. Is that correct? For sure. Us and uh, NHTSA. Yep. Yeah, very nice. All right, so we're going to continue on with the tour. You could just look at this occupant compartment compared to that one. Do they have uh, seat belts? Uh, I don't think it did. Maybe a lap belt at that point? Yeah. No. Ford was the first one they even had, it was an option. I, I, knew, I know seat belts were um, like dealer installed options on some vehicles if you really wanted to go above and beyond and order seat belts. So if you had two brand new cars with automatic braking and you sent them towards each other and they were really good, they may both stop before oh, they Oh, they hit. most definitely would both stop. That'd be yeah. a really good video. Yeah. Uh, Just run this and say, here's what we, happens we've, now. Uh, we've, we've done, well, one of them would stop. <laughs> <laughs> So do you have to switch off all the, all the safety equipment before you run into a wall then to automatic break in and? Yeah, actually we, um, for this crash, for frontal crashes, yes, we'll disable the radar and cover up the camera with a piece of tape, mm -hmm. but they typically won't work with the engine not running in neutral anyway. So we're told, but we, you know. Yeah. And this is how you store them on top of each other? Well, this is our, we call display hall where we put vehicles on display, um, show how we developed our crashes through re from research right up until our crashes and then the ratings afterwards. Oh man, well, this is fascinating. This is our new, uh, our new side 2.0 crash test. We've had a crash test since um, the mid 2000s, um, which is developed from the Explorer behind you. Uh, SUVs became popular the late 1990s, you know, and and all of a sudden people started dying in side impact crashes that they weren't dying in before uh, because of SUVs, the higher vehicle and the heavier weight. So we developed a crash test with a um, MDB moving deformable barrier, uh, looking at photo there, to replicate an SUV running into a vehicle. So we did that crash for 15, 20 years, but Vehicles have changed, SUVs getting bigger and heavier. So we just updated last year to a heavier uh, MDB going at a faster speed. And that's the 2.0 side test, which is these two vehicles are an example of good and bad. Yeah, you can see the body side outer peeled off of the rocker right there versus this body side outer, outer stayed intact. It's, it's all about occupant compartment. You, you keep that large inside there without intrusion 
your chances of uh, being okay increase this one actually move the seat it peel the seat frame off yes yeah, there's nothing good about that yeah it's almost like if the if the impact would have been lower it would engage this lower rail and yeah. it had a way different story but well, that without the strength tying the b pillar into this it's kind of a moot point well that's exactly why we developed the tests we have because the government crash test does load the rocker more uh, whereas ours raises our so impact you, above it in more of the occupant compartment. do you find that sedans have a worse result than suvs because they're, they're lower because the rock is going to be lower close to the ground are they worse yeah well there's some over there but uh yeah i would say until the manufacturers respond which they're they're already doing and um, you know, I I will guarantee you this Honda in three years will will do do much better when we test it the redesign. You know, a lot of it isn't rocket science; it's additional welds and structure. And but this this chart here that's on the graph shows shows how manufacturers do respond. Um, we don't have a lot of data for the new test yet, but you know, when we first started doing our old side impact crash test, you know, is mostly poor rated. Oh yeah. And, um, you know, as, as we tested year by year, we, for the last eight years, they were all good with a couple acceptables thrown in there. But people were still getting hurt in side impact crashes. So we researched why and found out bigger and heavier SUVs. Now, Sean, I have a question for you. Well, actually first the statement. So, we benchmark cars all the time. And a lot of times it's from a cost and weight manufacturing perspective. But I'll have people say, what vehicle should I buy? And I say, you should buy the newest car, the newest car you can, 2021, 2022. And they go, well, why? And I said, the safety improvements. So showing that chart right there, seeing the improvement oh, for the past 10 or 15 years, um, your organization finds all of the, the small scenarios that could put a passenger at risk and you try and mitigate that. Yes, it drives cost into the vehicles with higher strength materials, bigger airbags, better glass, better everything. Um, do you ever feel really good about the lives you're saving? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's why we do what we do. Yeah. Um, I think in our uh, 50th anniversary celebration, we had a researcher from, I believe, North Carolina State who did a study on how many lives this place has saved. And that was 2009. It was like 150,000 lights. Yeah. And that was, uh, that's a town. That's, you know, that's a big town. Yeah. So there's one thing that when we're advising clients is we never compromise when it comes to cost reduction and meeting many of these standards, whether that's adding high strength steel for the Sorb crash, uh, packaging room for the airbag for ejection mitigation. Um, these are things that the whole auto industry as a whole is in lockstep with so yeah, we really appreciate and, uh, yeah. and to be fair they don't want people to die in their vehicles either you know they they want to do the right thing yeah. your updated barrier actually looks lower than the original one didn't didn't you say it went the other way up it, um i guess it looks lower it's about the same height but it is a lot heavier uh, it's um 1900 kilograms versus 15. that may sound like a lot heavier Plus, we're, we're crashing it faster, too. What speed? Uh, it was like 31 miles per hour was the older one, like 36 now. And, it, you know, mile per hour is a lot. So five is exponentially uh, a lot more energy. So how did you pick that number? The, the speed? Uh, just real world crashes, a lot of looking at real world crashes and, and EDR this, data, police reports. And this represents a left-hand turn across an intersection with a red light. Uh, run, it, it, or? It's, it represents just getting hit in the side at an at a small angle. Now ours is perfectly it's perfectly perpendicular. perpendicular. Oh, yeah. I was looking at that. Yeah. So '97 is when you first started. '92 is when this place opened, but it was a few years until we actually we had ratings test. Um, 1995 was where the first ratings came out for the frontal test. Only one test was run here at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, but we ran a lot of them. Frontal 40? Yep, frontal 40, 40 miles an hour. 
and you know just like the side test the the chart up there will show you know manufacturers responded they, we used to have a a 97 transport and then a, a 2000 i think and additional spot welds i think was all that was needed yeah. to improve that performance and look at that toe board intrusion on that yeah we just we just do not see that anymore no I mean, our ratings for the the uh, occupant compartment, there's a lot of zero intrusions. Very strong. Uh, we, we found in some cases we saw um, mitigation on one side of the vehicle, not on the other. Yeah, we did too. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> I think they're being more balanced now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Which, they Particularly with Sorb, you yeah. can see all these yep. kickers and pieces of aluminum to help load the rail or keep the oh, rail straight you know, all that. against the yep. engine. But And then... Uh, now they're on both sides because you a, test both sides now, right? There was a certain pickup truck that we found only had a countermeasure on the driver's side, and we didn't think that was right. So we that's so we began to pass their side small overlap, and they reacted program. pretty quickly, I imagine. Very quickly. Yeah. Um, do you, do some you, apologies were given. Do you test both sides, or you just flip a coin? We test both sides. Okay. Oh, yeah. our, our rating system is driver side and passenger side. Yeah, because small overlap. There can be different monuments on the right side, like a battery or something that yeah. can load the rail. I think a GM product got good on the left side and uh, marginal on the right. That happens, but that's often not structure and more like dummy kinematics. Really? Yeah. Okay. Do, you, do you do one test of each? I mean, you got a data point of one. We, we try, but. Uh, we have a budget like most people. Uh, we, we accept verification data from manufacturers. Uh, we vet it very, very carefully. Yeah. We, we review those crashes as well as we do our own. Um, and we perform audit tests. So about every, every 10 verification tests, we'll run an audit test to make sure that that verification test is legit. And we trust they are. I'm sure you get a lot of collaboration with the OEMs, right? Oh, not, we're it's not an constant adversarial. communication. They'll be here today. Yeah. Hmm. These vehicles are the midsize SUVs we run to our new moderate overlap front test. We um, keep them here after we crash them until all the reports are written and then the news, the news uh, release is sent out. And then off to the junkyard they go. Yeah. Which ones have performed well? The Hyundai? Um, as far as structure, they've all performed well. Yeah. So how do you pick which trim level? I mean, I see there's a lot of sunroofs. Do you pick a well, high trim level with lots of Currently, uh, we used to have a vehicle criteria list that, you know, alloy wheels and leather and whatever, cloth interior. But now we, we buy vehicles for headlight testings and AB testing. And we, we're going to use that same vehicle for this instead of buying multiple vehicles. So the trim level, it, Honestly, the trim level shouldn't affect your safety. Uh, some roof, you have leather, some roof would have some it effect, right? It shouldn't. Huh? It should not. Not for the test well, running. Know. It has it actually. I think in roof crush tests, sunroofs actually make them stronger because there's more structure up there. So, uh, but I mean, every vehicle gets a good roof crush rating now too. So, what's the roof crush test? Two times? Four. Four times. Yeah. Government standard was one and a half. So explain the reasoning behind uh, changing that. Let's go over there to that okay, display. Yeah. We um same test. Well, or, same test, basically same amount of force put to these two force, vehicles. Yeah. Fifteen thousand pounds of force was put to this vehicle. Fifteen thousand pounds of force was put to the the Kia Sportage. That is. That is pretty stark. I mean, you could open the right? door and drive away in this one. This must have been a an outgoing architecture. This, yeah, honestly, this was a newer architecture. It, that's true. And you know, two years later this one was good as well. Yeah. Yeah, but this this test was developed because, you know, people were dying in rollover crashes. The, the occupant compartment was just getting crushed. And as I mentioned, the uh, federal standards were one and a half time vehicle weight, which is not that much, you know, dropping a car a foot maybe on its roof. Yeah. So we upped it to four and a half times vehicle mass. And like the other test programs, manufacturers responded. Um, they're, they're pretty much all good. We're, we're phasing this test out, actually. 
We're just going to accept manufacturer's verification data. Do you find the, the, the domestic OEMs respond quicker to your results than... No, the, I think uh, it depends on how easy it is, how close they are to a you know, changeover or something. Yeah. But they all respond pretty quickly. I, don't, I wouldn't say one responds better than the other. I'm proud of this one. 2010, we had, we had some researchers looking into underride crashes and for, with semis. So then we bought a few semi trailers, uh, had our local trucking company lend us a tractor, parked it in the crash hall and started running Malibus into the rear of them. I've uh, personally crashed 36 2009 Chevrolet Malibus underneath trailers. It's gotta be a record. Uh, so just testing different designs. We're just testing, not the car, the rear underride guard rear impact guard, I should say, rig, that's what they call them in the trucking world, of semi-trailers. Uh, the Canadian standard was was tougher than the U.S. standard. Um, the U.S. standard guard in 2010, um, anything would go under this. It, it, I mean, a 20 mile an hour vehicle would probably go under the guard. The Canadian standard was five times that. But so thankfully, most manufacturers of trailers didn't want to make two different trailers so they made the canadian standard so trucks can go across yeah. the border so we benefited from that uh, but there's one scenario where if the vehicle is off center a little bit because the the standards basically are loading it straight on off center a little bit the vehicle's going straight under regardless more load except for one manufacturer yeah. did well so uh, because they had the verticals outboard more those two verticals, that's every trailer. You've seen thousands of these, right? So it, it did well. So we thought, well, we'll give them an award for stepping up and doing the right thing. And then another manufacturer stepped up, another one. Now there's nine trailer manufacturers either have standard or optional guards that win our Tough Guard Award. And they did not have to do any of that. This is, we are not a regulatory yeah. um, that, when I drove to Michigan in 2015 to see family, I saw one trailer with a Tough Guard award that I, you know, I, because I've tested all these, yeah. I recognize them. I saw one. Uh, our last trip to Michigan in June, I stopped counting after 100. I, they're, they're on the road now, and this is going to save hundreds of lives a year, which may not sound like a lot unless it's somebody you know. Do you ever consider how hard you push a manufacturer to improve, and is it is there too far. And let me give you an example. I'm a big NASCAR fan. I saw you had a bunch of NASCAR uh, cars in your in your office. Full roll cage, five point harness, helmet, fire suit, crash at 150, 180 miles an hour, typically fine, even with a, a Hans device. So if I drove down the road in a 2022 NASCAR and I got hit by somebody going 80 miles an hour and I rolled off the side of the mountain, I'd probably You'd get, up get out fine. Away, yeah. So is, where does the reasonableness of, because then a NASCAR costs like $300,000, carbon fiber, welded chromoly steel. I mean, it's probably wild how expensive it is. There's like a, a balance. How hard do you push and what's your criteria there? Our, we don't really push them. Okay. We try to recreate what's happening in the world. Yeah. And that's what we do. And then we'll tweak it up a little, right, I guess. But, I mean, we could run these tests at 80 miles an hour and there'd be no survivor. And, yeah. then, and then what, you know? So our crashes, our crash modes, when they first come out, there's a range of good to bad performers. Yeah. And then everybody tweaks up the good and then we'll maybe push a little bit more. But if you push it too far, nobody's going to respond. Yeah. From this door, the display hall this way is vehicle prep. Uh, where we do, you know, prepare a vehicle for an actual crash test. Uh, the room behind Paul is our photo studio. Uh, when a car is first delivered to this facility, it is put in this room, put on a turntable, spun around, and numerous pictures are taken. Hi, Joseph. Hey. Coming into your room. Yeah, go ahead. Come on in. This is the measurement studio run by Joseph over here. He, he measures every vehicle. When I say measure, I mean we, this is our post-crash measurements, our pre-crash, sorry. So do you scan it or? No, we don't scan it. We have a, a, a CMM arm. Oh, okay. 
You, you guys probably have one of those, I imagine. No, we I should have one. We should should probably have one. should have it. So yeah, we'll set, he sets the seat where it's supposed to be for the dummy. We, it's quite a process. You have to put a, is it in there? Yeah, he's in there, or he's going in there. A, um, this is a system developed by Umtree, University of Michigan Transportation Research Institute. They have a little uh, fixture over there called Oscar, right, Joseph? Yes, Oscar's about to go in. Oscar's about to go in. That is exciting, isn't it? <laughs> so Oscar goes in. He's a fiberglass and titanium device that, when put in there and measurements are taken, tells us where that seat goes. So this is, this is so, what is this, a Colorado? This is so Chevy can take... Oscar put it in a seat and put it exactly where we are. It's it's just a generic. This is just how the the industry positions a seat for a 50 percentile male dummy. So Joseph will set the seat, take all the pretest toe pan measurements, door opening. Oh, we don't take door opening anymore. Uh, sets the steering wheel. Uh, with the origin being the door striker. We have recovery points on the opposite side, far away, which we'll use to come back after the crash and find out how much each component moved statically. Do you have a auditing process or do you double check like so after this is done is there any is oh yeah any, after this is done is there is you have another we have another technician come in and, come verify, in and verify, verify yeah that this is correct because it's a very expensive test you want yeah we we measure um, measure three we, times we try to avoid at all cost buying another sixty thousand dollar vehicle so after the vehicle is measured comes over here on the lift where all the fu fluids are drained the gas is taken out stoddard's put in with dye so we can see a fuel leak it's purple uh, we don't want to run with gas yeah. in a vehicle. Um, but basically, it's just prepared for the crash. Airbags are defeated on the non-struck side, so we don't block camera views. Um, it's a huge checklist full of items we have to do to prep it, put the stickers on and the stripes and the decals, paint the tire, put the tie-down chain so we can you know pull it into the barrier. Not in this case because it's a side, but... So with, Mount a, the with, cameras an e, and the lights. with an EV, is there any additional, like you have to display oh, the high voltage? Oh, there's tons of additional, yes. For an EV before, after Joseph's done measuring, hey David, after Joseph's done measuring, we pull the master service disconnect out uh, and then we'll hook up Tom, you know, Tom, that's what he does. He, he'll hook up lead to the high voltage battery and I'll show you the, the box that we use to measure it on the Mach-E. And then we'll verify the voltage works. It's not grounded to the chassis. Um, that's called the isolation of the, the battery. And then we'll check that again after the crash to make sure everything's shut off before anybody touches it. There's no, nobody touches that vehicle until Tom gives a thumbs up. So once you're done with your measurements on an EV, do you drag it outside just in case? Uh, after like after a, the crash? Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, we don't store EVs in the building after it crashes. We have a shed outside with two EVs in it right now, I think. Here's another thing we do for electric vehicles. We have isolators on our fork truck. Ah. In case we do have to get this vehicle out of the crash hall after the crash today, because yeah, there's already. smoke, fire, whatever. We'll pick it up, forklift driver safe. We park it outside. The fire department will be here today. We have them come out for every uh, electric vehicle test on the off chance, hopefully uh, very off chance, that something goes catastrophic. So some of the, the newer EVs are very heavy, 10,000 pounds. Does that yeah. cause you any problems with the, the equipment you have? We haven't done one that weighs 10,000 pounds yet, but we have recently this year three times tested our crash machine that'll pull 10,000 pounds. Because when this system was designed, that was unheard of. Yeah. We had no idea. We weren't planning on testing heavy trucks. So, uh, 
you know, now a, a mid-sized truck is 9,000 pounds. So yeah, we uh, verified it'll work, so we can test them coming up. This is where the magic happens at IIHS. So the car will come through that door right there. It's probably a long run. How long is the 600 run? 600 feet. 600 feet and run into this barrier right there. So if you've ever seen a crash test, it's most likely happened here. If you've seen it online, right? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And uh, Sean was explaining these huge lights up here are turned on. So there's a ton of light for the for better filming. A ton of light, you, yep. you need to have a lot of light. And uh, he's saying it's so much electricity, they had to run their own trunk line. So it's pretty wild. And, and Eric's getting jealous here because every one of these cameras you see are about 100 grand. How many frames per second, Sean? We film at 500, but we, you know, we could go to 1,000. 500. Here we are, only at 60 frames a second right now. Come on. This block weighs whew, 180,000 pounds. So, so when you test so the Hummer, that's going to move a little bit, right? No. <laughs> Is it anchored to the floor? Or just, no, it's, it's just weight. We've got a little... Uh... My, my dad flew out here once when I first started working here. And uh, he flew in, and I picked him up, brought him here, showed him around. I told him how much it weighed. He said, that's funny, the, the guy, the, the pilot on the airplane told him how much the airplane weighed. He said this was two DC-9s <laughs> compacted into this cube right here of concrete and metal. We have four pretty large air casters. Um, I don't know if the airline's over there. It's like a four-inch diameter. We have an air compressor as big as a truck to run air to lift this thing up, and then we can move it off the floor. Now, these are air motors that we use to, sounds like, um, like somebody gassy, and it, it just moves this, this white painted area on the floor here. The concrete's many feet thick there. If that thing were to go off of this white painted floor, it would go just through it, into and then we'd be out of commission for a while. <laughs> Until we find a crane that can lift a couple hundred thousand pounds. And get it through the door. But yeah, this, this thing, it was built here and it'll never leave here. <laughs> we call it the, um, the block. I feel like we're in like a secret uh, government underground bunker. <laughs> So what's the max speed you can get up to? Well, I'll, I'll show you our crash machine that's under that block. Um, the, the motor, uh, is it? The, it's, the pulls the cable? it's a hydraulic. Oh, okay. It's a hydraulic motor. We charge up, we have one little pump that charges up 20 some accumulators and it's all stored energy and it just meters the fluid out to the motor to spin it. We could probably spin it fast enough to where it just starts shredding everything. So there's no, I don't really know the max speed. We've done 60 miles an hour. Really? Holy cow. But you know, at that point, then you're building friction up into the wheels and the yeah. pulleys and, you know, and at, at what point do you say, okay, we can do 90, but now it's ruined. Yeah. If they can't see it. What, what safety precautions do you have once you're ready for a test? Do these doors lock out? What about, oh, yeah. what when, about the when, garage when we doors? we fire up the hydraulics, magnetic locks locks every door in this area. This door stays shut until about a minute before the crash because it's environmentally controlled in here. The dummies need to stay 70 degrees. So right before the crash, about a minute, this door will go up. The door down there will go up. The lights will come on. The house lights go off. The main crash lights come on and then starts rolling down. It's a very slow acceleration. About a third of the way down, it's accelerating, then it's holding speed the rest of the way. Okay. A lot of labs, they'll accelerate all the way to impact. And oh, so it'll be... So it's at 40 miles an hour when it hits. It's at 35, 30... 20 feet before that. Uh, so you get to a nice constant and speed. And then we just hold control it. control that. And we that's control nice, it yeah. with... Um, that's, that's one of the bonuses of having a hydraulic <laughs> system, servo hydraulics. You can just meter it and hold that same speed. 30 minutes later.
So we just witnessed the crash live, and this is our initial impression. The Mach-E held up surprisingly well. I mean, barely any deformation at the back of the fender. And they were showing us some of the older vehicles from 20, 30 years ago that, that you know, folded up like a, like a house of cards. But Paul, you used to do this for a living. What do you I think? I did. I haven't done it for a while, but it's, uh, you know, you've seen that the vehicle hit the barrier at 40 miles an hour. Still make sure your heart speed up a little bit. And this, this, this actually did very well. I've always been impressed with Ford's uh, crash structure, and this is no exception. Um, as Corey said, the fender moved back, but it tucked under the, the, the oops, door skin of the door. I shouldn't touch the vehicle there. So you'd be able to, you'd be able to open the door easily, get the people out. Um, not too much intrusion. The, the wheel stayed intact, which sort of surprised me. So it moved back, hit the tire catcher at the, at the footwell area, uh, transferred some load and some rotation to the other side of the vehicle. But it all, it all happened as it should have done. It's a, it's a really good vehicle from, from initial look. Yeah, and a big thanks to Sean, who stepped in right here. Go ahead. So we just had an amazing day here at IIHS. Thanks to Sean for showing us the ropes here. Amazing facility, amazing people. It works like a well-oiled machine. Right after this vehicle hit the barrier, everybody walked out and knew exactly what they were supposed to do. People were taking photos. People were sweeping up the, the little bits and pieces. Um, there was a lot of safety precautions taken. Yep. So you want to run through what was done because well, it was an EV? The, the first thing we do before anybody is allowed to touch this vehicle, we check the battery isolation. We make sure that the high voltage battery has been shut off from the vehicle, which they're all designed to do during air de airbag deployment. Um, so we verify that, then we verify the battery is not grounded to the chassis, um, check, check the temperature throughout that whole process. Uh, before we touch the vehicle. Uh, we have the fire department here, you probably saw them just in case something goes wrong. But yeah, after that, um, after that's been verified, it's just like any other test. We yeah. post crash measurements, pull the dummy out, look at the dummy data, um, measure it and then we're done. Well, this was my first crash test that I witnessed. It was louder than I imagined. The, the energy dissipation you know, filled this room. It was quite amazing. Paul. I know you've been in this industry for a long time. What do you think about you know this facility and this it's, test? It's great. Yes, I think it's better than any of the OEM facilities I've seen. Um, it, with, with a real skeleton crew to get everything done, so it's very impressive. They got great facility, great people working here, as as, uh, as Corey said, and it, it works. I truly believe you're making the world a safer place. So I really thank you for everything you do. Thank you. All right, everybody, this wraps up our trip to IIHS. If you want to see more amazing crash videos, IIHS has their own YouTube channel with about 318,000 subscribers and I believe a quarter billion views. So some really great content coming out of this, making the world a better place. So thanks, Sean. Thanks, Thank Paul. Thanks, Talk to you later. Bye-bye.